Pisto Ruiz Ferreira's Velo I. Keynote. Uh, today we have Peter Mallon from Spotify, uh, a very, very experienced software developer. And today he's going to talk about System Z, which is a microsystems modeling uh, and is currently used at Spotify for, to understand and gain a complete view of their systems. So, uh, Peter, without further ado. Thank you. Oh, that's loud. Somebody turn down the volume a bit? Yeah, okay. Yeah, that's better, I think. Is that okay for everybody? Cool. So, um, modeling microservices uh, is what this talk is about. And, uh, but let's talk a little bit about me first. So I've been at Spotify since 2013, just over three years now. And I've been working on uh, infrastructure. So I'm in, in a, a tribe that's called Infrastructure and Operations. And some of the things I've been doing is uh, work on our service discovery tools. It's something we call Nameless. I'm mentioning it because it comes back later on. So that's the process where, uh, you know, when we, say, scale out the service, we increase the number of instances that are available for some service, then that's how it registers itself with the central system and becomes discoverable for other things uh, that want to call it. I'm also currently working on, uh, we can call it like our drop wizard analog, if you're familiar with that. So it's a, a framework for building, easily building backend services, microservices. It's called Apollo, it's open source, you can check it out. Uh, and I've been working on System Z, which is the, this talk, and then some, some other stuff, random things. The structure of this talk is you know, a few different things. What, first of all, starting off with what do I mean by modeling microservices and why that is something that you uh, might have to do. Uh, I'm going to talk about our solution, System Z, how it works, how it's been designed and then run, running off with some, some conclusions and uh, the impact that introducing systems that into Spotify has had. And I hope that you guys will, will learn something or get some ideas about running microservices at, at scale, whatever scale means. Um, so let's talk about that. Scale. This is a, uh, a picture, it's called, uh, or diagram is called the, the Scalability Cube. It comes from a book called The Art of Scalability, which I haven't read but I like the picture. Um, and they basically talk about scalability on different axes. So you have the, the x-axis, uh, cloning, which is where you make copies of the same thing. So if you imagine you have a system with a web server and a database, and then the web server uh, gets overloaded, then you make a copy. So you have another one and another one. That's scaling out on the x-axis, cloning. But then the database runs out of capacity. Right? it always becomes the bottleneck, we know that. Uh, and what you can do, one, one solution then is to shard the database. That basically means you say that, uh, you know, you apply some hash function to the customer IDs or whatever, and then you say anybody whose uh, custom, cu hashed customer ID ends with a three ends up in this database, and, and then you have 10 different databases that deal with different subsets of the, the complete uh, set of users that you have. So that's sharding. You uh, split uh, something up into different uh, components. And then you have the y-axis, which is splitting off different kinds of things. That's when you say, okay, we have the login service here, and it's one thing, and then we have the search service there, and it's another thing. And then you can scale them independently, you know, both on the x and, and z axes, uh, axes if, you, uh, if you will. And, and the, the reason why this is relevant uh, is that as you move up, in particular on the x and y axis, I would say, into this corner. Then oh, you move, whatever that corner is, it's not a corner, it's like a, it's open-ended. But you, you get more and more complexity in terms of having a lot of things, different kinds of things, in a lot of different places. And you need to manage that, some, com some complexity somehow, you need to understand it. So that's uh, what this talk is about. And to get some numbers, uh, at, at Spotify, we have you know, about 14,000 servers. It's not exactly as the same as cloning, but it's relevant. And we have you know, maybe 1,600 things that we're tracking. Uh, I'm going to talk more about what I mean by things. But, uh, and I think another aspect that's really relevant as well that isn't part of the scalability cube it would be like a four-dimensional cube if you would add this in as well. And I have no idea how to draw that, so I didn't. But it's 
we have about 100 developer teams that work on adding features uh, to this backend. And that I think also you know, adds to, to the need for, for the, um, uh, a model for your microservices where you can collect data about them so that people can understand the system. And let's, let's talk a little bit about how teams work at Spotify. Um, because I think that, uh, I don't know if it adds to the confusion or if, if the confusion would be there anyway, but I think it might. So Spotify is organized into uh, tribes and uh, alliances, tribes and squads. It's kind of a hierarchy uh, where uh, the, the central unit or the most important unit is the squad. The squad is a, a team of, you know, the normal seven plus minus two people, sometimes plus three, sometimes minus four, or whatever. But it's you know pretty small team, and each of the squads has end-to-end uh, -end responsibility for some feature or some set of features. So, uh, the you know a good example I think is the, the the squad. It's called Kiwi. They own search. That means that they own the search function for Spotify everywhere. They own the, the Android UI, they own the, the iOS UI, the web UI, the desktop UI. They own uh, the servers that do the actual search logic. They own the data processing jobs that index uh, all of the content that we have and put it out into uh, you know, the format suitable for the search services. They own the deployment, the operations, and you know, everything. They're testers in there and you know who sounds like a lot but they actually manage this they're a big team maybe 10 people or something but they they can manage all of this and to, to enable that we also have uh, teams that you know so so I would fit in this would could be my, one of my teams we're building infrastructure so we're building tooling for for the feature squads we're providing uh, you know uh, and, and there's like one team that provides network support and, and so on and similarly for client platform, so there are different teams. There, this is an old slide, they're now called application developer productivity, so they, uh, they own libraries and, and like uh, processes for, for, for build, making client builds and actually shipping them in, out to customers. Um, and and the, the thing that makes this you know, uh, particularly relevant for this talk is that uh, the intention of the squads is that they should be autonomous. So there's a, a product owner, there's a, you know, a, and all of the different technical skills, and squads make their own decisions. They're not under any obligation to coordinate with any other squad. Uh, that's the whole point. That's why they have own the end-to-end -end re responsibility for their feature. And, um, and the idea is, of course, that we should be able to move quickly, even though we, you know, we're, we're getting to be quite a large company, but we still have this autonomy concept. Um, and of course, having autonomy uh, is great for making decisions locally with, with great understanding of the problem at hand, but it's not so good for, for coordination and, and uh, you know, organization and making sure that uh, you know, the teams solve uh, similar problems in the same way. That doesn't happen often in, at, at Spotify. We have a lot of uh, different solutions to very similar problems. Uh, it's a trade-off, you can make it either way. I think it's a good trade-off for Spotify to be fast uh, in the team but you do lose something when you when you make that choice. I would, you know, if you're interested, I would I would urge you to take a look at this. It's like a 15-minute video. Uh, it's really entertaining, I think. Um, oh yeah, one more thing about about teams. Uh, Spotify has been growing very quickly, uh, almost un un up until about two years ago, pretty much doubling in in the number of developers uh, every year, and uh, then pausing for a bit and now growing again, pretty much as quickly as we can find the good people to hire. Uh, and the way we do that is through cell division, uh, basically. So uh, a squad, you add people into a squad, and then it becomes too big, and then you split it off into two squads. Uh, so, uh, and then, obviously, you, you have to sort of divide the responsibility that they have into two in some, some meaningful way, and split out the, the things that they own in, uh, into, different, uh, into the two different squads. So all of this leads to some problems that need to be solved. Just understanding what is out there. Like you have a hundred different teams that can deploy things and do deploy things continuously. Like what, what is there? What, what's running on, our, on, on these 14,000 servers? Are there still 14,000 or are there more? There are probably more now. I don't know. Um, 
if you own something, where is it running? You, know, you need to understand that. It's, it can be hard to find out. How is it configured in those places? If you want to understand the system as a whole, how, you know, we have all these things, how do they call each other? Is that, are they doing it the right way? If something is broken, who owns this thing that's broken? How do I find more information if I want to call that thing or use it somehow? And if it's broken, like how, how do I fix it? What is broken? So all of that leads to uh, a need for, for uh, me systems metadata, I call it. So it's like you know, data about the systems and services that run in our, our back end and front end as well. And I, I clicked my clicker a bit too soon because unfortunately I'm using a, a, a PDF instead of the beautiful keynote presentation that I had, li had lined up, so I don't have speaker's notes. Uh, and some of the animations won't be animations, it'll just be slide transitions, so it won't be as pretty, but hopefully it'll be okay. So, uh, what came before? Let's, uh, um, let's, let's talk a little bit about that. And, and before System Z, we had Emil. Uh, he's, uh, his title, I think, is like operations director or something like that. And he, he's been at Spotify forever, uh, in Spotify terms, which is about seven years or eight years or nine years. Uh, and, and he and a couple of other people, uh, you know, they, they some years ago, they knew exactly what was out there. They knew all of the people, so they n knew if you want to understand something about the login service, then you talk to this guy. If you want to understand something about where you user data is stored, then you talk to this guy. Um, but as the company grew, both in, in people and in the number of things that are running there, this became too big. Like you, one person couldn't fit all of that in, in their head or have all of, all of the connections, social connections with people that were needed to, to do this. So that's when we entered into the era of what, what Emil calls rumor-driven development. You know, maybe this guy knows something about that. I'll go talk to him and then you'd have to spend a, a day or two walking around the office. Or, and if you were based in the New York office, then you were screwed because you couldn't walk around the Stockholm office to find out. So we created a system uh, maybe three years ago called ServiceDB. To do this, it's a, you know, the name says what it is. It's a database of services. Um, that was kind of a, you know, an effort done sort of on, on the side and it didn't like have proper ownership and didn't get, get enough love. And um, a, th a thing we do in, in IO, my tribe, which is infrastructure and operations, we're building tools for, for the rest of the, the, the teams at Spotify, is we send a, a yearly survey, or we do a yearly survey, more like in-depth interviews. And the, the topic is what sucks about IO? So we're trying to find out what people, what our customers are unhappy with about the things we do. And ServiceDB in 2014, December 2014, showed up as the, the number two offender. Like it's the second worst things, thing about I.O. So we decided we need to solve this, um, uh, this, this problem of, of rumor-driven development and uh, a sucky ServiceDB. So we decided to create System Z. And if you log into System Z, uh, you get presented with something like this. So it, this is me. Uh, these are things that I own. I've been working in many different squads, and uh, squad membership doesn't get changed, so I'm, I own 60 things now. Uh, and this is really not showing well. Sorry about that. Uh, w it's fine, um, but I just wanted to. It would, would have been nicer if it showed better. Um, so uh, System Z. That's, um, what kind of name is that? There was a talk, uh, first talk yesterday morning here was, was Blake Irvin talking about the importance of naming and, and one of his recommendations was uh, you should uh, name things for what they are. What's, what's that? So the story is actually, when we started building this, we didn't know what it was. It, it was hard. Like we, one, one of the old names was Service Dashboard. So, uh, and there's still a, a URL in Spotify, service dashboard.spotify.net, but it doesn't work. And, but, but it wasn't quite a dashboard. So we felt, okay, we don't exactly know what the thing is that we're building. Let's give it a really crappy name, so we know we're going to change it later on. System Z. And, uh, and it's still called System Z. And, and uh, I think that's fine. Like, I was one of the people arguing in favor of that name, because... Um, you know, it's like my, my name is Petter, 
uh, it doesn't say what I am. You know, I'm a father, I'm a programmer, I'm lots of different things, but it kind of gets all balled into this thing that is me, Petter. It's the same with System Z. Once you familiarize yourself with that, you know, you can have a name that, or something that's kind of complex and vague, and it still becomes meaningful, so I think that's okay. It is funny, though, though, though that we were sure that we were going to change it. We didn't. All right. So let's talk about terminology uh, in System Z. We have two primary things, uh, two primary concepts, I would say. One of them is a component. It's a, a thing. Uh, and so t examples of things that we track in System Z are microservices, uh, data stores, uh, data pipelines, so like a, a processing step or a, a set of related processing steps in, in, in data processing, uh, and uh, client components. We also track libraries and, and you know, other things in there. And the system is some, some grouping of related components. And it's, the, you know, this is kind of vague. Uh, and, and the reason is, uh, it's very much intentional. Uh, and the reason why we wanted to do that is very much, I would say, explained by the fact that we have uh, 100 autonomous teams that do things. Uh, and that means that they will do things in, s in slightly different ways. So we need these terms to have enough sort of uh, slack in them so that you can shake them a little bit so they will fit you know, all of the uh, things that the different teams do. Uh, and, and so far, they actually, they actually seem to work uh, okay. Um, and this, you can almost see that. Uh, this is an architecture diagram that I drew about three years ago when we were building Nameless, this uh, uh, service discovery system that I mentioned before. And I'm showing it here because I think it's, uh, it, it's interesting to, to like have a concrete example of something that uh, predates System Z but fits in the System Z terminology. So the blue box, this is a blue box. Uh, it is the nameless system. This is a DNS server. We're using DNS for the, the discovery side, which is um, go away. This is um, uh, a Java process that feeds data to the DNS server. And this is a data store, Cassandra data store, with stuff in it. Uh, and this is another Java pro process that gets heartbeats from services that are up with some information about who they are. And this is some command line tools. So you can see how we have a system and we have a few components in the system. Two of them, I would think, are classic microservices, these two Java things. Uh, the data store is not a microservice in my mind. It's still a component and we want to track it. So that's why service dashboard isn't a great name because not everything is a service. And the command line tools are also not uh, a service, but we also want to be able to manage them in the system. There's also another concept that's illustrated here. You see there are you know, arrows coming in from the outside of the system. That uh, We have a, a concept of, of public and private components in uh, System Z. So a public component is something that um, uh, somebody outside the system can use, and private components can only be used inside the system. So the data store is kind of obviously private, as is this nameless discovery process. But you can call, you can obviously register yourself with a registration process. All clear? Good. Um, <coughs> so let's talk about some use case-ish things. Uh, and this is where I'm, I'm sort of regretting that we're not doing Keynote. Uh, but as, as anyone, like, you know, as, as somebody who's just interested generally, you can find out things like overviews. So you can understand things like, you know, what, con what are the container versions that are used for different services? Container version is like uh, what version of, uh, the, of like uh, backend or framework libraries is being used to produce uh, in this microservice. So, you know, are you using Apollo version 0.6.1 or 1.0.0? Uh, and are you, or are you using something older like a Python based thing or, or whatever. And currently we're tracking about, we can see about 30 of those running in our, our backend, as reported by 40 different services. 
but since we have 1600, there's a lot of them that don't tell us anything because they don't have that cap capability. And we can find out much, let's see, I think I have a slide here. Yeah, so this is the container version overview. You see that the two components are saying that they are on Apollo standalone 0.0.0-unknown. I don't like that version, but it's out there, apparently. I, um, I think this is a better one, 0.6.3, it's old. I think they should be on 1.0, but you know, at least I can see that there are you know, a, f a number of instances with these names that are you know, on different versions of the com uh, component frame, com backend server framework that we have. And you can also see like these metrics, they don't show that well, but you can see, you know, we have 17 production components that depend on components that are flagged as experimental. We have 12 components whose owners are whitelisted. So we have some business rules internally saying that because ownership is such an important thing when you need to get responses or, or, or feedback about something or just understand something, uh, we have a rule that components should always be owned by a squad, except sometimes it's okay for it to not be owned by a squad. Uh, it can be just a loose collection of interested individuals. Uh, and then we whitelist them. So we have 12 such components, and they're listed here, and there's a comment saying, you know, the UIO chapter is okay for the nginx-dummy-c component. Okay, whatever. I don't know. Okay, as a user of a component, so that's, uh, I, I want to use something that I don't own. Here are some of the things that you can do in, in Systems Ad. You can figure out who owns it, uh, and that turns out to be one of the, the most important features that people use in Systems Ad. You can understand its API if, if it's uh, implementing, uh, implemented using Apollo, because then we can track, uh, track that. You can see its state in the sense of un understanding uh, whether it's, there's a current incident ongoing with that component or not. If the owners of the component have you know, given us the information that we need to figure that out. Um, and you can find documentation if the owners have provided that link. So there should be some slides here. This really doesn't show well. Oh well. This says owner tools, system, system Z. So that's the ownership information. Here you have some links to documentation. This slide title here says documentation. Here's a button you can click on to get to the support channel for this component. It's uh, the tools ch channel. That's my squad. And you can contact us via email. And if you want to ping the product owner, it's Jimmy. And you can contact him like that. Uh, we have given, uh, we're using PagerDuty. It's an external product for alerting. So uh, if you provide the PagerDuty key for the system, uh, in your system metadata, then systems that will check with PagerDuty about the current status. Right now, there are no in. Oh well, when I took the snapshot, there were no incidents ongoing for this model, so that's fine. If you have a problem, you think that uh, you know the, the component is. You're looking at a component you think is to blame for an issue. You can click on this bullhorn, and that'll trigger an alert in PagerDuty, and somebody will get woken up, or yeah. hopefully it's office hours so they can fix it anyway. <laughs> that's nice. Uh, this is, uh, th these are tabs, um, and this tabs is API. You can click on that, and then you'll get uh, like a documentation about what are the URIs you can call, what are the parameters they take, and, and you know, those kinds of things. Um, yeah. And if you own a service, uh, you can do, among other things, you can do this. You can understand where it's deployed and how it's configured. You can provision new machines for, for the service. You can manage deployments. You can pick, uh, you know, you can, uh, the, the first bit is understanding where it is, and the second one, or the third one is, you know, uh, changing it. And you can understand dependencies. So who's calling me and who am I calling downstream or upstream, depending on your preferred point of view. So the same, same sort of view, component overview for sysmodel. Uh, this specifies that sysmodel version 
8EF038F dash blah 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 is deployed to three instances, and if you'd click on this link, then you'd see exactly which machine supports that is. This is a configuration tab, which will show you a view where you can see uh, all of the configuration values. And if there's a difference between different hosts, it'll be highlighted, so you can understand if there's a diff delta somewhere. This is uh, the deployment tab, I think. Yes. <laughs> Very sorry about this. This really doesn't... Uh, is completely ununderstandable. But here you basically have uh, builds. So whenever this uh, component is built by Jenkins, then information is published here uh, about what builds are available. And this is deployment groups, so some groups of servers that they think is a good thing to, to uh, combine. So B, for instance, is called metadata proxy canary in one of our data centers. and. D is metadata proxy canary in another data center. So you, you can choose to deploy a build to like the canary set of hosts and then va validate that it looks okay and then deploy it everywhere as you want. You can roll back via this user interface. Um, and then this is the, here's a capacity uh, planning tab which looks something like this. You can see uh, for the, uh, the access points there, you want to have 20 in uh, this data center, and there are actually 20. It's stable, it's fine. And then you can create another pool of things. So you say, I want to have more servers in some data center, and it'll add it there and deploy it and run it for you. Dependencies. Um, so here, this label says dependencies. It's stuff that this particular service is calling. So sysmodel is calling something called silo. This is declared and runtime, and it's calling sysmodel-es for Elasticsearch, which just says declared and an orange dot. So this is um, uh, declared and runtime means that in the static information that the owners of sysmodel, which is my team, have provided, uh, we're saying we're going to call silo, and we're going to call sysmodel-es. And then Apollo, uh, this backend uh, service uh, framework, it's capable of detecting what calls you're actually making for some kinds of calls. So Apollo has detected that you are in fact calling silo. So this is green. You say you want to do it, you do it, it's fine. But it's unable to detect the calls just to Elasticsearch because we haven't built that into the, to the uh, thing. So it's just declared, it's orange, it's a bit of a warning, there's something right here. If you would be calling something you hadn't declared, that would also be an, an orange dot. So, because it's, it's indicating that you're not aware of something that you're actually doing, and that might be phishing. Uh, oops. So, and then this is dependence. It's actually, the list is a lot longer. Uh, so this is where uh, we list the things that are calling you. So here it says that the sysmap service is in fact making incoming calls to the sysmodel service. And based on that information, and this information that we're getting from, from both the runtime and static uh, declarations, we're, we can, we're using a tool called GraphViz, uh, which is uh, you know, just a, a, a way to, you can, you can specify dependencies and then it, it'll draw charts for you. So this is the, the, the runtime and static, uh, this is the auto-generated version of the architecture diagram I showed you uh, earlier with nameless. So this box is the nameless system, and there is a DNS, which is the DNS server. There's the discovery Java process. There's the Cassandra data store. There's the registry Java process. And then there's a couple more. A nameless polar, which is the thing we're using to uh, validate that things are okay. And podlinks, which is something that's used to, to control routing between different data centers. So if this data center is unaware of the thing you're looking up, you should go there and look. And then these are things that are calling nameless registry. Uh, and again, apologies for the quality of the, the image. It, it looks nicer on this screen. Um, okay. And besides that, you can do a lot of other things. I'm not even going to try to read it out. But uh, an observation is that uh, sys 
system Z has become, uh, you know, uh, a kind way of putting it is a Swiss army knife where you can do everything. And the less kind way is a kitchen sink where, you know, you just stuff things without organization or, or control. And this is something that we've been watching for a while, you know, six, seven months or something. Like, as, as we've sort of seen that system Z is gaining popularity internally for as the place to do things. Uh, that that's also has a, a danger because then it becomes even vaguer than it is and, and should be and, and less precise and, and more likely to become like a, you know, a, a spaghetti kind of um, bottleneck for everything place. Right, so how do we do it? That's what it does. What's the design like? We, um, every time I show this, this picture I say the same thing. It's, it's amazing how long time it can take sometimes to come up with stuff. This is about three months work, worth of work. Not completely full time, but you know, near, near enough. And we ended up with four boxes and four connections. Yeah. <laughs> <coughs> so, but this is what the core data model looks like. And, and we have uh, the core data and then we have lots of other data that is added by different features or, or used by different features. And um, you will see that there's a lot of many-to-many -many relationships in this. I'm going to go through them. Um, and I'm also going to talk on the next slide or set of slides uh, about the discover names thing. But let's, let's go through these. So if we start from system, uh, I mentioned what that is. It's a collection of related components. So a system contains a number of components. A component can only belong to one system. No problem. A squad owns a component and can own many components. Obviously, we have 100 squads and 1,600 things, so you know, we have to have shadow, uh, ownership like that. The interesting thing is the other direction. More than one squad can be owners of a particular component. And, and the reason for that is it's shown by our history, like the way that we expand through meiosis, I don't know, cell division, mitosis, meiosis, one of those. Uh, so, and, and sometimes in the process of, of splitting up a, a squad into two, it's really hard to determine who should actually be the owner. So they leave both squads as owners and that's fine. So we have to cater for that in our model. Um, discover name, that's a name that's like a label or an alias for a component. So when you do discovery, when you do lookup of components, where is the login service running? You don't ask for the login service directly, you ask for a discover name for the login service. And a component can register multiple discovery names. Oh, let's, let's do this one first. Actually, that's easier. We'll do this one first. A component can depend on multiple discover names. That's the outgoing calls that a component makes, and it's obvious, you know, that you can have fan out, so you can have uh, can make many kinds of calls out outgoing. And the same thing for the uh, the other direction. You know, many other components can call you. So that one's obvious. So this one then. Uh, a component can register many dis discover names. That's you know, not a, not problematic. It's like you have different aliases, so you can call a service uh, George or Bob, doesn't matter. But the other direction is a bit funny. More than one component can register the same discovery name. Why is that? I'm going to tell you, because it's not obvious. And I'm going to do that by an example. This is um, the process that the Zool squad is currently in the middle of. And the Zool squad, they uh, own the uh, login and user data uh, aspects of Spotify. So like the user database and the login functionality and everything that relates to managing users. Um, and, um, and, and it's obviously like a very critical part of our infrastructure. Uh, we have hundreds of millions of users uh, in that database and uh, we don't want that to ever be down because then people can't use our service. Uh, the current implementation is a service called User2. It's old and it's written in Python uh, and it's starting to, to crack. Uh, it has been starting to crack for a while. And um, 
it's it's doing too many things. So the things it's doing is you know uh, handle login attempts, handle creation of new users, and handle modification of user attributes. So like, are you a premium subscriber or a free free subscriber, and other things like that. And it does that via two different discovery names. So the login discovery name maps to those instances of user 2 that handle logins, so they can scale that separately. And the user 2 discover name maps to those instances that do user creation and uh, attributes updates. But the thing that the, the, the Zool squad wants to do is they want to get to uh, this state where they have three new services written in Java because it's a lot faster. Um, so user 3 will, will be handling login, the attribute service will be handling attribute updates, and the create will handle create new users. And how do you do that without downtime and without breaking anything and knowing, knowing for sure that this is going to work the same way as before and perform as well as you need it to when we're talking about, I don't know how many thousands of requests per second in a big database. Their plan is to have user 2 register a new discover name, user 2 legacy. Nothing is going to call that. Then uh, they create, oh, that should say user 2 proxy. Uh, so they create uh, uh, another backend service that's called user 2 proxy. And then they have user 2 proxy register user 2 and login as well. So what's, uh, what's happening now is that when somebody wants to call login, they can get sent either straight to user 2 or to user 2 proxy, which forwards it to user 2 legacy, and it ends up here again. So we add a hop. In either way, like in either case, the, the caller will get the same result. And then user 2 stops registering uh, these two discover names. All of the traffic goes through the proxy. OK? Then they start working on these, these three new guys. And when they're getting ready uh, for this, they can have the proxy start sending traffic to these new uh, discovery names. And this is another really interesting state, because what they do, and they're here now, around here somewhere right now. Uh, what in, in this st uh, stage, what you can do is uh, you send the requests both ways. And you collect both responses, and then you look at them before you send them back to the client. And then you can say, OK, they had different responses. Why is that? Is it something that we wanted to change, or did we want this to be the same? So you can be much more confident in your implementation of the new things here. You can also not send everything to these new guys. And that way, you can validate performance. So you send through 5% of the requests here. But like in this case, they're building it in Java, and it's Python up here. So they don't worry about performance. And it's, uh, these guys are like 10, time, 10 times faster in latency terms. Um, but it's still an extremely useful state to be in when you can actually validate that your new changes are, are, are working. Once they're confident, they can have callers start calling one or more of these new uh, discovery names instead and retire the old server. So user 2 is gone. And that's... Uh, that's the, the, the cause of celebration. At Spotify, we, we celebrate when we kill something. We don't celebrate when we add something new, because we do that too often. So killing user 2 is going to be a big celebration, I think. Um, and eventually, people will stop calling the old discoverer names, and that thing can be, can be uh, retreat, uh, retired. So they're there. And that's why we have this, this facility, uh, or this indirection between the discovery name and the, uh, the service. And that's also why we have the ability to, for, to have different services register the same discovery name. So we can do this kind of transition. OK? Good. Oh, that actually is visible. Nice. I redid this diagram yesterday. So that, uh, that was lucky, the day before yesterday. This is a, it's not exactly correct, but it's sort of roughly correct, uh, or showing the ideas anyway, of how the architecture of System Z looks like. So we have a front end and a back end. Um, and both of them are, uh, I mean, the back end obviously is like a set of microservices, so, so it's, it's modular and, and you, know, you have that flexibility, uh, kind of obviously. And the front end as well, 
we have like a, a platform part, and then we have some base features, which is what we own in, in my squad. Um, and then these orange dotted lines indicate you know, other teams or, or team ownership, I should say. So the capacity tab uh, that you almost saw is owned by another, another squad, and they deploy their code into systems ad, the front end stuff. It's Angular JS modules. Uh, and the same for the deployment thing. And they have the capacity tab will talk to different backend services that this team is using, and the deployment tab will talk to some backend services that these guys are using, and, and we have our own. So RDC here is short for runtime data collector. That's the thing that <coughs> at runtime goes out and talks to uh, the different instances that are running and finds out what, how they think they're configured, what outgoing calls they've been making, what incoming calls they've been receiving, and so on, what version is deployed. Um, and the idea, obviously, is that we should be able to, to have System Z be uh, the, the unifying interface for the things that are being done by many different squads at, uh, in, in I.O. Very many things here, many services, talk to something that's called SysModel. And SysModel is the, um, the, the service that provides access to the static information, static metadata about um, uh, our, our, our backend. And that data is in fact retrieved from various Git repositories. So the service configuration lives in YAML files with people's code uh, instead of in a database. And, and the, uh, yeah. So uh, the reason I'll, I'll get back to that a, a bit as well, the reason is that. Um, we wanted to make it very clear to people that this is their data. You know, it's not something that lives in somebody else's database. It lives with their code, so it's their data. You, know, you own it, you had better make sure that it's good. <coughs> Using YAML uh, means that we have, uh, I've written loose slash multiple schemas. And, um, and what that means is uh, you know, we want the flexibility to be able to add uh, different kinds of functionality and uh, for different teams to add their own data into these YAML files. Uh, and then, you know, so I don't believe in anything such as schema-less. There is no such thing. There's always a schema, but it might be implicit, like only defined in code. So that's why I said loose, but it's not schema-less. <coughs> and so, so one aspect of, of system that, that I think is um, uh, troublesome and interesting, perhaps, is that the data is really, really dirty. And, and this is you know, maybe caused somehow by some Spotify-specific things, but I think it's also some universal constants. So we have a lot of organizational change that leads to ownership confusion. Not only uh, in that you don't know who owns something, it can also be the case that's a lot, it's very frequently the case that you know, squads own things that they don't know anything about because the person that built that thing is now in another squad due to this you know, cell division thing that's been going on. So, uh, so that happens a lot. And we also evolve our infrastructure. I was showing you the example of the 30 different container version. That's because we have evolved the way that we do things. And not all of these uh, historical versions are capable of responding to the same kinds of requests. So we cannot collect the same kind of runtime data about all of the uh, different things. It depends on, on what they are and what they're based on. <coughs> uh, and I think another source of, of you know, data dirtiness is uh, it's the same mechanism as with code comments, really. When you're writing the code, you don't write then and there benefit from commenting it or updating a comment to some changed code. Somebody else does later on. And it's the same thing with the metadata. As an owner, it's only very few things that you actually benefit from updating somebody else will benefit and then you know that that doesn't uh, that's not enough motivation to keep this always up to date uh, and so so we're trying to do that that's some of the features I mentioned before are, are there to uh, mitigate this a little bit so we have the the warnings the you know developers generally speak speaking like things to be clean and ordered and if you see orange things about your server service then you might update that and fix it and make it correct and, uh, and also that's the reason why we have it living with the code, because we wanted to make sure that people know that it's their data, it's their responsibility. 
this doesn't show at all, so I'm not going to talk about it even. Uh, it's our promotion for uh, getting people to use uh, System Z. Ten things about System Z. Ten things you didn't know about System Z that will amaze you. It was printed on A3 papers and taped to every toilet door at Spotify. Showing uh, usage. So uh, page views, different kinds of pages. Uh, you can see that since October 2015, this is April, uh, usage has increased a lot. We have about 400 monthly active users or 200 weekly active users out of maybe 900 in, in technology, product, and design. So a lot of people use this every day or every week. Um, and you can see things like the, this blue thing here is uh, the capacity management tab. It's an experimental feature has been added and it's really popular, so it's growing. <coughs> We only last week did a survey to users to find out what they think about System Z. Um, and, and this is some answers I collected to the question, what is System Z to you in one word or more? I don't know why we said it that way, but we did say it that way. So it's, uh, you know, some, the administration pa panel at the back end, the IO product to rule them all, Cthulhu, I don't know, <laughs> maybe. Hydra-headed. A service without a definition of done. So uh, uh, this was interesting to me because I think, like we feel in, in the tool squad, that uh, System Z has a, a vagueness to it, and it's like it's all-encompassing, and that's not good. And uh, our users probably feel that as well when they say Cthulhu, Hydra-headed for sure. Um, so some some notes about impact. Um, Bef you know, the, the autonomy concept again, uh, it applies to infrastructure squads as well. And before System Z, um, all of the squads that built some kind of a web admin tool would have their own tool. So you'd have to have, you had have lots of different tool names and different URLs, and you wouldn't actually know where to find it if it wasn't something you used every day. And the fact that now a lot of the infrastructure teams are integrating their si things into System Z, that makes it easier for our users to find them. That's a, an unexpected benefit of it, but we like it. Another thing that we didn't expect was now, because teams integrate their features into System Z, teams in I.O. that build related things start talking to each other about them, and they make their, you know, their, their, their UIs more consistent. And so things like you know, service discovery, uh, deployments, and, and builds, they're really related closely. And you want that to be some one kind of user flow. And, and th that's starting to happen now, which is great. In the 2016 uh, version of WhatsApp in I.O., uh, System Z didn't show up on the WhatsApp list, but people said it was great without being asked about what was uh, While being asked about what was bad, they said, this is good. So that's nice. And it's a kitchen sink or Swiss Army knife, which is a danger, I think. So, wrapping up, if you work with microservices, that gives you many small things, which is good because each of the things is, are sim is simple, but the big picture is hard, and you need some kind of metadata about all of the things you have, uh, beyond some point that you need some kind of metadata and the system to manage that metadata for you. Um, we definitely have dirty metadata. I, I have a feeling that that's unavoidable. I also have a feeling that some of the things we do make that uh, data more dirty, but I think this, this aspect, this comparison to comments, I think indicates that it's, it's a probably a universal constant. Combining many tools gives better collaboration and consistency. Uh, this comment, this, this thing about how it's good to have deployment and build be related in the user uh, interaction, user experience, even if the teams building it are different teams. And that the, the metadata, the same metadata, can be used in many different ways by different kinds of users um, is also something that we've observed. Any questions? Is this available? Is it open source? Uh, so the question, I don't think it, people heard you, it's, uh, is it open source? And uh, I got the same question last time I did this talk. And then I said, no, and we're not going to open source this. 
it because it has too many Spotify specific things. Uh, now my answer is no, but we are considering open sourcing it. <laughs> so um, uh, because it's you know things like uh, the runtime data collection was one thing that I felt was very Spotify specific, but that is actually part of Apollo, and Apollo is open source. So we have this metadata API that we're exposing that you know can can be used. So if, if other people can use that, then they could also use this. So. So we're considering it. It's uh, not an easy thing because it's there's a lot of Spotify specific stuff in there. Any other questions? No. Yeah, one more. <laughs> um, I want to ask if you are completely rel relying on the metadata, or if you um, rely on configurations through a configuration management tool or through agents as well. I'm not sure I understand the question. To gain all the information, you rely completely on the services, of, on the microservices metadata. So you rely on the development teams to, to have all the endpoints, or you also uh, integrate with some uh, monitoring tools or other agents? OK, yeah, so I think I understand the question. Um, <coughs> the data that's presented in System Z comes from two main sources. And one of them is the static data that's uh, this, these YAML files. The other one is the runtime data that we collect. We have a, a, a daemon that you know, goes out and, and just looks up all of the different discovery names and connects to all of them and tries to fetch metadata about it from them. So like, which version are you? Um, what is your configuration like? What is your API? You know, what JVM version are you running? That kind of thing. Uh, so, and then, so all of that is collected. So for instance, when you look at API documentation, in System Z, you're looking at what the service is saying. This is my API, the running service. It's not uh, static information. It's uh, 10 to 11 now, so um, I think we'll probably have to wrap it up there. But a massive thanks to Peter. And uh, apologies for the slide deck. That's, uh, that's our fault. But uh, thank you. A round of applause, please. Thank you.